get going here. Hope you've had a blessed week. I hope God has tremendously blessed you in ways that you don't deserve. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Yeah, me too. It's amazing what he does and why, why he does those things for us. I'm, I'm excited today about this sermon because I want to We've been talking about the things that have got us where we are as a church in uh, the last 10 years, but also getting ready and getting amped up because some of, not all of the same things will take us into the next 10 years. There will be change, there will be adapting, there will be different things go on. That's just the nature of anything that grows. And I don't believe God is done growing us yet. I still believe there are people that are lost and do not know Jesus and I believe that God has set us apart to be the church that changes this community and how change occurs the base level of that is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. People must know that Jesus is the thing they need. Not just that they need, it's, it's the thing that makes everything work. And you go, Vince, I've had Jesus and not everything's worked in my life. I'm not going to preach on obedience today. But a lot of times I think that Jesus hasn't changed yesterday, today, and he won't change forevermore. And so when we can wrap our minds around the reality that Jesus is what we need in this community and in our homes and in our schools and in our churches and in our, in our, just our daily lives, then I think things will radically begin to change. I know because I was told this when we launched Real Life Church so many years ago. Hey, what Mountain Home does not need, another church. And I said, that's perfectly fine, and I would agree with you. I would agree with that statement, except God has called me to plant one. And since God has called me to plant one, I refuse to simply just be a church in this community. But we will be a church that changes the community. And so I appreciate you guys going with me. We, that first week we talked about urgency, that your friends and loved ones, people you know and some people that are close to you that you may not know are dying and going to hell, and there ought to be an urgency in us that reaches out to them. There ought to be something in us that we wake up in the middle of the night thinking about them and praying for them. If not, then you need to begin praying that in your own life, or I'll begin praying that for you. So you can call me on Wednesday if you haven't slept any this week, and that's okay with me. Uh, uh, you can get upset if you want, but I won't stop praying for the lost, and I won't stop praying that you would be the one that would reach the lost. That's what I want for your life, because I'm going to tell you, there's no better experience than being able to walk someone to an introduction with Jesus Christ. So we have this idea that we were talking about urgency. Last week we talked about giving and generosity. Our church has been extremely generous. In the 10 years that we've been in existence, we've given over a million dollars away outside our church. Just, we've just given it away. I say, well, did you just give it away? Well, we gave it to mission work. We gave it to benevolent work. We gave it to local ministries. We gave to different areas because Christ called us to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. And so that's what we're doing. We're giving church. We're generous. This week, I want to talk about worship because I believe we ought to be a worshiping church. We started just a few years ago. I think it's been in the last year, the year before COVID hit, we, we started doing communion regularly where it was available regularly, where people could, that could partake in it. And we, for a long time, I really struggled with this. I just struggled with how do we do this. Uh, Pre-COVID, we were running about twelve to 1,400 people a weekend. And that's, that's some logistical work to figure out juice and crackers for 1,400 people in a way that you can rotate three services around and make it happen and, and be able to get through it. But I just, we just felt that it was an important thing that we needed to figure out a way to make available. And I'm so thankful that we figured out that, hey, we want to, we want to provide this. So at the close of service, you're going to have an opportunity to take communion today. If you've been with us at Real Life Church, when we've done this before, uh, I'll, I'll get into a little bit more about what that means to be taking communion and how your heart should be. And it's okay if you don't. Communion is not obligatory for you today. If you have not had time to set aside and, and really go, God, this is where my heart is and I need you to take a real close look at it, then that's okay too. You, you can come back next week. We're going to offer it again. We're going to offer it every month. It'll be available for you. But also I want to say this with communion. We can, no matter how often we do it or how little we do it, we can make it something that it ought not be, which is just an act. This is just what we do. We can do the same thing with church. If it's Sunday morning and you're at church because it's Sunday morning and you're supposed to be at church, I appreciate that, but I pray that your depth of relationship with Christ would go further than it just being the thing we check off our box. 
I pray that it becomes a relational thing where this is where I come and I'm with the community. I'm with the, with the people that God has put me with in the body that God has put me in to do the service that God has called me to do. That's why I'm here. That's why I come to the local church body. So today I want to jump into this idea. If you have your Bible, we're going to be in two different places in the gospel. Luke is where we're going to be first. Luke chapter 22. I'm going to talk about process. How many of you in here believe you make a fantastic cup of coffee? Say amen. Amen. Hands raised. Who makes a good cup of coffee? Kyle, you make a good cup of coffee? What's your process? Lots of cream and sugar. Lots of cream and sugar. Okay, so Kyle just confessed to making a good hot chocolate. What, who makes a good <laughs> cup of coffee? Like any, and I know some of you are like, a good cup of coffee is a black cup of coffee. Can I get an amen on that from anybody? Yeah, heaven's going to be torn. There's going to be a line of people either scowling at the coffee or a line of people going, where's the creamer? And so, I'm not sure. So, you make, Aaron, you make a good cup of coffee? What's the process? No, you, you're making your cup of coffee. Huh? French press. French press. I don't know what that means. <laughs> okay, so I, I need more definition on the process. How do you start? Scoop the coffee. How many scoops? Five scoops for eight cups of coffee. Hold on. How many of you think that's too weak already? <laughs> Amen. Got a few amens. <laughs> you, got, you got a few military people in the house going, what? <laughs> so, all right. So, all right. Now, you, now you, just you. Oh, if it's me, then we're going to do a, cu- a, cup, a scoop per cup. A scoop per cup. Okay, that's how I've seen you make it. Okay, scoop per cup. Then what? Okay. When the water boils, you get in, pour, slowly pour the water around the kettle, around the press, and so it seeps, and then after a few minutes, you press down so that all the coffee comes together. That's a pretty involved process. <laughs> How many of you are just letter drip? <laughs> all right. Okay, that's okay. Both are fine. Like, the, the point here is there's a pro- Who makes amazing pancakes? Anybody? Like, pancakes is your thing. Pancakes is your thing? Like, uh, all right, now, what's the process? Oh, so you legit make pancakes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My kids are like, Dad, your pancakes are awesome. I'm like, thank you, Aunt Jemima. Uh, <laughs> and then I hide the box. I'm like, I know they're good. <laughs> so... So, like, full, full, how long does it take you to just get the stuff ready to make pancakes? I've done it for years. Done it for years, but that's the process. And at the end of it, the product is pretty amazing. Yeah, I got, a, I got an amen from next to you right there. <laughs> so, all right. So, we got coffee. We got pancakes. Who makes a killer steak in the house? Over here. Oh, no hands except one. What's your process? Salt and pepper, throw it on the grill. How long on either side? About five minutes on either side. Are you a rare, a medium rare, a medium, a medium well, or a well? Medium rare. Atta girl. Atta girl. Okay. I'm about to have church up in here. Got red meat that's still red, praise Jesus. <laughs> we went to a steakhouse one time with some pastors, and one of the pastor's wives ordered ketchup. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what every it was like a scene out of a movie we all got our steaks and it's like this place was legit known for their steaks and we go in there and we're all getting ready to cut in and all of a sudden we hear somebody go could I get some ketchup please and it was like a movie <laughs> like everybody was like what just happened you know so uh so how many of you are stuff on your steaks and how many of you know that a steak is meant to be eaten by itself amen by itself How many of you are A1 people? There'll be an altar call in just a moment. (laughs) Be able to handle that. So we've got coffee, we've got got pancakes, we've got steaks. All of them have a different process. How many of you have kids? Anybody want to walk through the process of making those? (laughs) (laughs) 
Hey, just so you know, that's a, that's a little bit of a heads up for our new series we're starting in February called Love on Purpose, okay? We're going to be diving into that, and uh, we're going to jump into some topics with marriage and relationships and parenting. It's going to be a lot of fun. Valentine's Day is on a Sunday. This needs to be your date day. Come right back here on that Sunday. You can go out, take her someplace nice after church, fellas, all right? But come here on Sunday morning. We're going to have a great time. I, I am a fan of process, although... I'm not good at process. I, I am a, I'm a wing it kind of personality. I, I, I'm fly by the seat of my pants. If, if you want to go, let's, let's do it now. Well, we need to plan it out. That sounds incredibly boring. Anybody with me? How many of you, are, that's your personality? Let's wing it. How many of you are like, no, no, we need a plan? Okay, good, good. It takes a mix. It, it takes a real it make, a mix to make it happen and to make it happen well. Jennifer's a planner. She's got notebooks and journals and things like that that she has, and, and I follow whatever those things say. <laughs> because if it was what I was going to say, like my entire life would be like the Phineas and Ferb cartoon. Like I get up every day and I'm like, what do you want to do today? That's kind of how I function and, and how I feel like I function the best. So I need some space for spontaneity. I, I need that in my life. But what I am figuring out as I get older, that everything I do, even the spontaneous stuff, is a product of some process that I worked. It's a product of a process. Through Scripture, you see this from Genesis all the way to Revelation. There's a process that God is, is walking through. And the product of that process, you see it in the Old Testament as he sets up the book of Leviticus and Numbers and we start to get a bunch of the laws and, and some of the sacrifices and we go, I don't understand these sacrifices, they don't make any sense. And what God is doing is he's establishing in the process an understanding that when the product arrives in Jesus Christ, there will be an unmistakable recognition of who he is. There was a, 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 an act in the Old Testament where they had two goats and the sins of the nation or the sins of the people were laid on a goat and he was called the scapegoat. And they would, ceremoniously, they would lay the sins on the, the goat and then they would take him away from the people, separate him from the people. And because that goat had all the sin on it and they couldn't look upon it, it was unholy and we see the same picture in Jesus where the sins of the world were laid on Jesus and then he was taken to a tomb where no one could see him separated from the world and and what a picture and so God in this process of the Old Testament begins setting up the New Testament where we see Jesus arrive as the product for all the process that we've just been introduced to there is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood that's set up in the Old Testament and then we see Jesus in the New Testament shedding his blood we see multiple different things. We'll talk through one of the offerings today as we get into the bread and the cup. But I want to just kind of walk through this today a little bit, and I want to talk to you about how worship is the process. But you might be surprised by the product it produces. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 19. Jesus has now got the disciples in the upper room. He's just walked through the my time is at hand speech with the disciples. He's trying to fill them in, let them know what's coming. And now they're at dinner, and he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them. Remember what we said last week, that nothing is blessed, or nothing multiplies unless it's blessed. This is Jesus giving thanks. He broke it, and he gave it to them. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out, and that, that, that phrase, poured out for you, is really important. This cup that is poured out, my, is poured out as the new covenant in my blood. Now see, the moment of communion in the Bible is really the epicenter of worship. I know what we've made worship or what we, how we kind of define it now. We go, well, when we go to church, the, the first 20, 25 minutes is worship, and then the preaching starts, and then that kind of thing. No, no, no. The idea of worship is in any activity that you are giving, are you giving worth to who allows you to do it? 
And so if you're here and, and, and the sermon is, is bringing something to you and it's benefiting you, then this moment is an act of worship. This is one of the ways that I serve God is through preaching. And so this is one of my favorite times of worship in the week. And, and I, 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 I don't do well in settings where it's just like turn the music on and let's sway. And I'm not wired that way. Some of you are, some of you are not. That's okay, it takes both kind. But we have to make sure we don't define something and then box it in. The idea of communion is the epicenter of worship. It is the first time Jesus said, I want you to partake with me in something that you will do after I'm gone. When you do this, remember me. He's, he's saying, hey, this is something that's going to be happening again, and I want you to remember this moment. I want you to give worth to this moment when you do it. I wonder in your life, do you worship like that? Do you worship like when I come to this moment, whether it's a Sunday, whether it's a a Bible study time, whether it is music in the car. Where, do, you, do you have those moments and are they just fleeting and passing like, oh, that was a good moment? Or do you give worth to the moment and go, my life is going to change because of this? And then take the steps to change your life or allow God to change your life. This is a uh, a tough sermon. It was hard as I was walking through it going, God, this is pretty heavy. If, if this is what it says and this is the process and it leads to this product, this is a pretty heavy sermon. Not everybody's going to enjoy the reality that what they have perceived as worship, what I've given to the Lord or what I've done for God is my worship. And, and he's going, yeah, you call it worship, but what is it worth to me? What are you investing? You see, because anything of worth has value, right? If I were to say, hey, Jeremy, give me a dollar. Jeremy would be like, you betcha. Dig in those pockets, find me a dollar. Most likely he would do that because a dollar, as much as we say every dollar is important, how many of you have lost multiple dollars under your car seats? Yes. Okay, we all have. But if I were to go, hey, Jeremy, I'm going to need 10 grand. There's a couple things. First is the initial thought of, <laughs> that ain't happening. I don't have it, so I can't give it. I don't have it, so I can't give it. I wonder how many times we do this to God in our worship where God says, hey, I need something from you. And instead of us going, God, how can I provide that for you? We go, I don't have it, so I can't give it. So I'm going to tell you, if it's something that's valuable to you, not that giving me 10 grand would be valuable, unless you're down, and then I'm in, all right? It's not that it doesn't have value, but sometimes we dismiss ourselves because we don't think we can get to that value instead of realizing that the value is the attempt. The value is I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that I show you what you're worth, God, in my life. That means I got to figure it out. It means I got to sell a car. It means, and I'm just, it doesn't have to be money. Maybe it's your time. God, I got to, I'm, I'm going to give up my time. I'm going to set aside some, some opportunities because I know this is what you're worth to me. And I want my worship to have value. You say, well, if communion is the epicenter, I don't really see the disciples walking through some of that. Well, that's because the worship moment here was Jesus's. The disciples got to be a part of it. But the worship moment was Jesus's worship moment. He'd come to the place where he knew in order for this all, and you say, well, Jesus knew from the time he came. Yeah, but the time had come. How many of you know there's a lot more anxiety and stress in the moment when it has to happen than the moment you're thinking about it happening? Everybody wants to be the one that takes the last second shot until you're the one that has to take the last second shot, and then the pressure's different. We see Jesus knowing the entire three and a half years of his ministry what he had to do, but I'm going to tell you that night in the garden as he sweat drops of blood running down his face as he prayed, the pressure was different. But he'd come to that place. It was a realization. And so here's the process. I had somebody this week make me unleavened bread, which had been what they would have used in the upper room. It was interesting because I called the person. And I said, hey, I need you to do this for me. And they were like, I've never done that before. I said, even better. I said, look it up. Check 
for authenticity and then make it. So they made it and they went to their house to pick it up last night. And as I was talking with them, they were, could not stop talking to me about the process. And about how when you make unleavened bread, throughout the process, you have to puncture it. And they were like, do you know, did you know, did you know that? Did you know that this, this bread that was going to be broken, this representation of Christ's body that was going to be broken, had to be, had to be beaten down and punctured so that it wouldn't rise? No, I didn't know that, but I know my God is pretty awesome to put the story together like that. You don't know unleavened bread doesn't have yeast in it. It's, it's made to not rise. It's also tough. Come here, Joey. But the Bible says it's broken. So Jesus broke that. Go ahead and break that. Now, it's tough, isn't it? It's got a chewy texture. Go ahead. Now, now, I'm the only one that's touched that other than you, so take a bite of it. It's, it's real tender, isn't it? <laughs> it's a little chewy. <laughs> yeah. You, like, you kept your half. That a boy. <laughs> you always tell people that have been hungry before in their life. They're like, oh, you're going to give me that? All right. <laughs> so I'm with you, Joe. I, I'm keeping the leftovers. This is my body. Just broken for you. He took bread and he gave thanks. And he broke it tore it. The Old Testament paints a picture of Jesus' crucifixion as something brutal. So one of the prophecies said that his beard would be plucked from his face to the point he would be unrecognizable as a man. His body broken on your behalf. This is my body which is given for you. A lot of theologians say this, that when Jesus was there at the table, when he broke it, he didn't go into the whole speech of this is my body, do this in remembrance of me, uh, that whole process. There's a Jewish prayer when they did sacrifices and offerings where the priest would simply offer and say, given for you. Like we would open a prayer by going, our heavenly father. In this Jewish prayer, they would break the bread and they would just say, given for you. And the people in the room would have immediately understood what just happened. You gotta remember these were Jewish men in the room, they grew up in this process. They grew up in the process. And so then we move on from the body. Here's the, this is my body. This is a physical thing that's going to happen to me. Your, your worship ought to have a physical component to it. There's something should change, not just in your heart or in your mind, but it ought to activate in your body. It should be something that you do. I hear people talk about, I have this heart of worship. I have this heart of worship. No, you should have a body of worship. You should have a life of worship that shows God what he's worth. The next part of the story, you all know it very familiar. He says, hey, this is my blood. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this is the cup that is poured out for you. This is the new covenant of my blood. And so we now have this cup, and we have this cup that is full. And Jesus is holding the cup, and he uses the phrase poured out. In the Old Testament, there was something called a drink offering. And they used either oil or they would use wine. It was the thing, two liquids that had the highest value to their people. Oil or wine, and they would pour it out in honor and in thanksgiving to God for what he had provided. What? Jesus is giving honor to God and thanksgiving for what he's provided. What he's provided is a cross tomorrow night. What he's provided is, but yet Jesus said he, it's, it's poured out. He poured it out, all of it. Emptied it into you and I. Emptied it into the disciples. Why? So that they would understand that their life was an offering and it was meant to be poured into the next. And so on, and so on, and so on. I wonder in your life, I asked you a moment ago if your worship had value. If your worship has value, who are you pouring it into? Now, I don't mean who knows you're a Christian. Who are you pouring out your life to, and who are you pouring out your life for? Because it matters. 
It matters that which is poured out to us. We, we so often, we get in this, this idea of communion is just we come up, we take the cup, we take the bread, we eat it, we go home, we go, we leave here, we hit the restaurant, we do whatever, which is fine, do that. But before you get to the table, what does it cost you? What does your worship cost you? You say, Vince, you told us at the beginning of this, this was all the process. This was all the process. This, was, this wasn't the product. No, it's not the product. We're not even there yet. I got more sermon. That was going to have to play for a little while. That's okay. They're ready. Because the reality of this moment where we talk about the body being this physical act and we talk about the blood being an offering act of being poured out completely to whoever I can pour it into that needs to know. All of those things, as, as much as this is the epicenter of worship, it is not the purpose that we come and we celebrate this moment. That's not the reason Jesus is setting his disciples down. That's not the reason that he brought them to the upper room was to break bread and pour wine. No, he was giving them the process. He was going, hey, I want you to see that there's this worship process that happens. There's this worship process that happens. Dale, come here. Man, you guys are going to hate sitting on the front row. I need you all the way up, buddy. There's a process that we see with the body and then the blood and the disciples sitting right before him. And what's happening here, it doesn't make sense. Because they're going, we eat this meal every year, Jesus. We understand what the Passover is. Just have a seat right there, Dale. We understand what the Passover is. We get this, and Jesus is flipping the script on it completely. He's going, no, you thought you understood, but my father was setting the process so you'd understand this product, but now I'm changing the process and going, hey, yes, this worship that you provide, yes, this worship that you offer, yes, this thing that you do is really important, but it's just the process, the bread and the wine. You say, well, what's the product then? What's the product? If that's what I'm supposed to be doing, how many of you know you're supposed to be worshiping God? Say amen. We all know that. But let me blow your mind. What for? Why? Because we're supposed to. Thanks, Dad. We know. Come on, we got to have. Why? Why? Because he's the King of kings and he's the Lord of lords. I'll give you that one. Because of all he's done in our life. I'll give you that one. That's what this process is showing. This is what I've done in you. This is how I've, I've shown you all that I'm willing to do on your behalf. But so often we forget that this isn't the end of the meal. In all the Gospels except one, we go from this moment to the walk to the garden. The walk to the garden. Everybody knows what happens in the garden, right? That's the moment. We know that. But in the book of John, the beloved, he goes, there's another part of the story. There's another part of the story. The Bible says this in the book of John. I want you to catch this. John chapter 13. And supper, Jesus said, knowing the Father had given all these things into his hands and that he had come from God and he was going back to God. You see, he knew what was happening. He rose from supper. I can almost see him as he walks to the counter and the disciples have no idea what's happening. He takes off his outer garment takes a towel he wraps it around his waist it would have been a customary way they would have wrapped they would have wrapped to be able to tuck the towel to where it harmed right here in the middle and then these fishermen and these tax collectors and these people that like you and I that had no no deserving seat at the table with the king. He knelt in front of them and began to 
grabbed their leg and they would fight him and they would pull back. No, 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 you're not doing this. He said, you don't understand. The whole idea of worship, the whole idea of me pouring all this out to you is the product of serving. You see, I, I can die for you. I can, I can pour out my life for you. But if I don't teach you that no matter your seat, you wash. I don't know if you know the role of the foot washing servant, but his job was to stand at the door. And as they came in filthy from the day, he would gird himself. He would fill a basin of water and he would scoop the water and pour it over the feet. And he would scoop the water and he would pour it over the feet. And the towel would be under so it wouldn't get the floor. And he would dry and he would clean. No one knew his name because he was a servant. Church, I don't know what you've been calling worship. But let me explain to you that if your heart of worship doesn't produce an act of service, then you've missed it in your worship. You've missed. We've missed. So we make today all about just showing up and singing some songs and hearing a sermon that hopefully challenges us and doesn't change us, then we've missed this whole idea of worship. We're getting ready to take communion. I love you, Dale. I love you, too. (laughs) Thanks for letting me wash your feet. (laughs) Thank you. Don't go to the table unless you're going to leave and do something for the master. Is that worship heart, man, it sounds good. Sounds really beautiful, poetic even. That worship is to empower you to go and serve. It's to empower you to go. Supper being ended, he knelt and he washed the disciples' feet. He washed the disciples' feet. Vince, that sounds ridiculous. Try it sometime. You'll never be more humbled in your entire life. I don't mean go rub your wife's feet before bed. I mean find somebody that you want to serve and go, hey, regardless of who I am or what I do, I just want to serve you. Tell me how I can serve you. Because church, that's when we'll make a radical difference in the community. It's not because we produce the best service on a Sunday. You know what? I'm glad you laugh. I'm glad we have a good time. I love to preach. Dallas and the team, they love to lead you in worship. I love that our music is good. Our singers are good. Our coffee is good. Praise Jesus. I love that we have a good time. But not once has a good time got anyone to heaven. Jesus said, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. And folks, he is worth following after. I want you to bow with me. This morning as we close. Come Holy Spirit, dry bones I'm simply going to release you. The cup. Juice, wine, sitting inside another cup that has the bread in it. If you're a guest with us this morning, you say, I'm not. No, no, you're welcome here. You can come feast at this table. So long as you know. So long as you know that Jesus Christ is your Savior. That you know. I'm not talking you doubt. I'm not talking you think. That you know that you have been redeemed and forgiven and washed by the blood of Christ. And this table is open. But for some of you here that maybe you don't know, and you're wondering what the next step is, then let me tell you this. Just as these tables are open for those that know, these altars are open for those of you that don't. Because you can today. 
you can know that this sacrifice, this, this bodily, physical sacrifice, this pouring out his life on your behalf, you can know that that was for you today. If you take a step. If you take a step. Listen. Can't control what tomorrow will bring. But I know here in the middle is the place where you promised to be. If you don't know this morning, come on, step forward. step out I don't know who it is I got it now somebody here you don't know you don't know yet you like Jesus you dig his people but you don't know for you yet you're not sure come on he'll meet you here we're not enough unless he's in our life come on take a step today pray and I'm going to close our services today Aaron's already told you about the offering you can give in the buckets as you leave you can text to give you know the drill out in the foyer you're going to see a, a sign by the connect counter where you can sign up and you can serve you can live out this process of worship all the way to the product you can go do that as you leave today but go do something for the kingdom. Go serve. As I say, amen, that will dismiss you to either come forward for communion or be dismissed for the day. I'd ask you to be respectful in the process. People will be praying. People will be worshiping. Father, I come to you and I thank you for this body and this blood. I thank you that for some reason, God, you called me. For some reason, you called us, God. And you redeemed us, and you forgave us, and you gave us purpose, and you gave us a mission, and you gave us a passion for that mission. But God, we need your help. Lord, we need your help in the process, God, in this process of worship, but also in the product of service that it produces, God. Let us not be a people that sit back and wait to be fed. Let us be the hands and feet that go feed. God, let us not be a people that grow accustomed to being served, but we be the people, God, that go and serve, that, that begin to shake the foundations of not only this community, but of the surrounding areas, God, in our state, in our country, in our world. Lord, there is a revival that's needed, and if it be such, God, let it start here in real life, in Mountain Home, Arkansas. Let the walls be shaken with those who need Jesus, God, and let us be the people that receive them, Walk them to redemption at your side. Lead us, Father. Guide us and direct us. We ask all this in Jesus' name.